Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com here at CES 2018. We are at the Mandalay Bay. CES Unveiled is just a few hours away. We have a great episode of Fast Forward for you today. We're going to talk to John Ellis. John, thanks so much for coming on. Dan. John is a technologist, a futurist. He's held a number of executive positions. He's worked at Motorola. He was the head of, of the developer program at Ford, which is how we met. Um, we run into each other at CES pretty much every year and have for the last 10 years or so. Yes. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about the zero dollar car, which is the title of a book that you just wrote. Uh, the zero dollar economy and what that means. Um, and the idea behind the zero dollar car is that uh, you, the car that we're going to be buying in the future may cost us actually nothing if we're willing to give away our data in exchange for that car. Um, we're going to talk about whether or not that makes sense, how you break it down, how we get to the math. Um, but I think probably a good place to start is to really talk about like what is this zero dollar economy to begin with. Um, so the zero dollar economy actually starts back almost 300 years ago. Um, in uh, 1709, uh, the very first newspaper had an advert in it for a Long Island piece of property. Uh, 25 years later, Ben Franklin uh, starts the um, Pennsylvania Gazette in Philadelphia, and it is filled with this newfangled thing called advertising. And so for 300 years, the advertising community and the information group got together, and that's how our information services and information economy built itself until about uh, 1998 when uh, two young men in uh, Palo Alto, mm -hmm. actually Mountain View, got together, uh, Larry, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, uh, founded Google to uh, seem, you know, to uh, basically what was it called, the, the quote is, uh, to organize the seemingly infinite amount of information on the, on the net. Uh, they did such a great job and boom, they're good, they're rocking. And it's, it's important to understand too, there were a lot of other search engines. Absolutely. The thing that Google did was figure out the advertising. Well, and that's what they were, so Larry and Sergey were, if you read history, they, they were very, very much about the purity of search. I mean, both of them PhD students. Um, and then all of a sudden, right, their investors are, you need to make money. So in 2000, uh, they introduced a pilot program called AdWords for 385 companies uh, to basically, it was a self-service platform that a company could buy an advertising word. What that means is when you were doing search, on the one side of your browser result would come up some advertising directed based on the, on the keyword search that you had entered, and then the rest of it would be your results. Uh, instant success. And so today, you know, 20 years, fast forward, or 17 years, 18 years later, uh, it's 96, $93.6 billion company, and it is advertising 100%. Um, and in fact, Google now recognizes as, an, as a, as a, as a uh, platform in the ecosystem that they need you to stay because advertising and the ability to direct advertising is only, is only as good as those people who are part of that ecosystem. So they build tools to keep you interested. And these tools help you save and, and, and solve problems, right? Docs, uh, Gmail, browser, I mean, some very cool tools. Um, and what we, in my group are talking about is that, you know, everyone calls them free, but they're really not because they take your time, they take your eyeballs in return. I mean, they give you something. I mean, they give you some value, but it's very asymmetric. And so um, we're arguing that it's not a free tool, it's a zero dollar tool. Ergo, Google's a zero dollar company. So a zero dollar economy is the collection of zero dollar companies. And there's many of them, Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, Weibo, um, you could start going into Instagram, WhatsApp, I mean acquisitions, it's all the companies that literally their entire business model is predicated on an advertising subscription model. Um, thus it's zero dollars. It's not free, it does, it does cost you something. I don't use the word doesn't cost, it does cost you something. It just doesn't cost you cash, it costs you something else. And that's, that's something I think people are just starting to wrap their heads around. And you understand the advertising model, but there's also the other thing that's paying for these services is data. Yes. And that's something that a little bit more recent development, but um, can you talk a little bit about, about the value of that data? Well, it, it, to go back even to, I'd like to go back to our newspaper uh, model, you know, people believed that they were buying a paper. People never understood the economics of newspapers. Like I bought my, you know, my Sunday for a dollar, yet it was filled in chock full. And they didn't understand it was advertising that was underpinning that. Right? So you, go, you translate now into the digital world and you're like, okay, I'm not paying anything because I can transmit it for free. I mean, I can download you know, Google Chrome or whatnot for free and now I, I have advertising underpinning it. 
I don't actually understand what's at play here, right? I don't understand what Google's collecting. I don't understand the data. And it is becoming clear as part of our book and as part of the tour, we go out to people and we're like, do you understand how Google works? Do you understand how the economy works? And when we start talking to them about things that are being tracked, start with your cell phone, start with you know, the ability to find out where you've been or where you're going, to be able to predict where you're gonna go. Um, it's beginning to freak, you know, people look at me like, they'll say four letter words and I'm like, yeah, okay, but it's, yes. And as we begin to explore that, I'm like, I keep saying to them, hey, at some point in time, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm actually agnostic. What I am suggesting though is that it is yours. It's been an asymmetric conversation to date. I think there's a symmetry that can happen and that's where the zero dollar car comes into place. To teach you, educate you, and then help you figure out how to, how to do something about it. So let's move it to the, to the automotive space, which is yeah. your area of expertise. I think people understand that, you know, how Google works, how Facebook works. They may not be happy about this data exchange and we can talk more about that asymmetry, but to then carry it out to a car and say, uh, maybe we start with just like, what is the potential in the automotive space to, do, to build this kind of zero cost product? Uh, so let's, let's break that question into what's the potential and then to actually do it. Right. So um, in terms of potential, you know, a modern day car today has anywhere you know, between 100 to 125 sensors. Some of the highest end vehicles coming out of Germany, for example, will have 150 sensors, computers and whatnot in the car. Um, and, and they are designed and put in place uh, for three simple reasons. Number one is to make the drive safer. And unfortunately and sadly to this day, still 1.25 million people lose their lives every year due to vehicle crashes worldwide. Uh, 40,000 people lose their life, lost their lives last year in the US. So engineering is continually putting stuff into the car to make it safer. Uh, number two is to make the drive more convenient, more comfortable. Uh, and then number three is to actually reduce the burden of driving. So we're on a path towards autonomy. Um, so they're going to continue to do that, again, until we can get to deaths down to zero, this is going to happen. What are those sensors? Wiper, uh, um, headlight, traction control, ABS, airbag, uh, we can look at your direction, we can tell you where you've been, the barometer. So for example, in the book we talk about six simple sensors. Uh, a headlight, a windshield wiper, a rain anometer, which is on the car so that will just automatically start. A rain anometer. A rain anometer. A rain anometer. Yeah. Uh, a barometer, which has been used for uh, understanding your barometric pressure so that we can figure out what, how to better burn your gasoline, uh, the windshield speed status, uh, and traction control. If I take those six sensors and combine them, engineering from automotive says we've made the car safer. Google looks at it and says, holy cow, that's accurate weather at a very localized level. And there are people who will want that weather. And so that's the potential. We've got weather, we've got where are you at, where you're going. What, does, what do advertisers want? They want to know where you are, they want to know where you were, and they want to know where you're going. And then they want to know, do they have an opportunity to influence that next step? So anything that they can get, as we've been seeing with data, they will use to try and figure out, would it take you 25 cents discount to get you to go buy that latte on your way to the convention center? Mm -hmm. Right, that's what they want, and so that's it's worth data. I think, you can, I think people can see how it would be worth something. Absolutely. How does it pay for a $40,000 car? So, Two answers to come to that. Number one is uh, these sensors are gifts that keep on giving. And so from the standpoint of um, one of the models we talk about is a lifetime buy. So um, if you were to say, for example, Dan, uh, I'm, I'm willing to give the microphone of my car to Google for a lifetime buy, meaning they can turn it on at any time. I mean, they may have to indicate that it's on, but they can turn it on, they can access the voice in the car, um, and I'm willing to you know, sell it for $6,000, lifetime, L lifetime. That's, we talk about lifetime buys on data, right? And what would, what would Google get out of having the voice, the microphone turned on in the car? Uh, how many people in the car? Male or woman? Uh, what language is being spoken? Potentially what gender is being spoken? As they start processing for AI, we start looking at Google Now and others, training data, right? I mean, again, the, um, what they get isn't so interesting as what they would do with what they get. And that's what we try and get to people. It's not about getting it, it's about what they would do with it. That's where the value is. It's a value pricing game. Data by itself is, you know, there's, there's the, Brian Chrysanis has said it and so many others, data is the new oil. Well, yes, but just like oil, data then needs to be refined. So the extraction is one, then it's gonna be refined, it's gonna be processed, it's gonna be made into something interesting and like Mind, if you will. Mind, data if you will, mind. yes. Um, but I, it's almost, but to stay with the oil, it's extracted, that's the mind, but then it's, it's, it's the same with all the, any, anything of you mind. You still have to process it, purify it, extract it to get, that's the value proposition. And so from that standpoint, you wanna be a part you know, your parents always said to you, negotiate the value, not the time. Negotiate the, the end value. 
So again, this idea is what would the value be? Now, is it 30, is it five, is it two? Some of it's provocative to get you to think, so it's, it's so extreme to get your head around it. Um, but no one's actually pushed back a whole lot. I mean, we did some sample testing with National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. These are folks that have to figure out big weather for the US. And uh, they spend millions of dollars a year, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, building and maintaining weather stations. Turn around and buy data from where the actual people are and where the actual entities are. So there's money in the system, whether or not it's the exact 3,000, 2,000, 4,000. That, again, that's the caveat. The second part of this is that's about a combustion engine car. What happens when we go to a, a, an electric vehicle? If you look at Tony Siba, for example, he's an economist and futurist out of Stanford. He has a model that gets a, a, an electric vehicle on a per mile basis down to pennies per mile versus where it's at today in terms of dollars. If you could get to per, you know, pennies per mile, suddenly the idea of a zero dollar transportation service, zero dollar ride, right? Dan Costa, do you care that someone knows that you went from point A to point B? No? Great. It's a totally subsidized ride by Starbucks. Mm -hmm. The ride concept is way more applicable, but today we're still in a combustion engine, so we start with the zero dollar car, which is the combustion engine car. So what do you think, uh, I mentioned a lot of people hear this and they're terrified. And they're like, Wait, I've already, I'm already tracked too much. This is going to track me even more, even if there are trade-offs that I could make. Um, it, it seems like they, that individuals don't have the ability to actually negotiate these things, and that Google's just gonna take the data, uh, their auto man manufacturer may just take the data, and <coughs> They won't, have a, they won't have a seat at the table, per se, because they really haven't had a seat historically. Right. Um, how, does, how do we prevent that from happening? So, part, so, so at the very end of the book, we talk about, you know, once I can get you excited about this is a possibility, now we can talk about, okay, what, why, the, why does it make sense with the car? And it makes sense with the car because so far to date, the zero dollar economy has always been in a digital, ephem you know, ephemeral world. With the car, we could actually get it into a material, real-world opportunity. Um, and therefore, under a highly regulated, because car sales and buys are highly regulated, contractual in nature, so imagine that you do put the contract in place that says, okay, great, then this 40,000 car, let's go. I, I want to buy the mic on behalf of you know, so-and-so for $6,000. You agree to buy it? Yes, you do. Okay, you sign, I sign, $6,000 is taken off of the purchase price, and you can keep walking down. So that's the positive side of, of taking it down to, to zero or near to zero. But the flip side of that is, what if you don't want to sell the data? So what if you don't want it to be mined and extracted and to be processed? What if you say no? Now you have a contract that says, you do not have my permission to take this data. So we now instructionally impose a restriction on data collection. For the first time ever, we actually have a legal mechanism to impose I'll say privacy, but to impose a no, a negative, I do not agree. And that doesn't really exist today. No, there's the opt-outs, which again, we don't know, auditing is hard, but this would, now this would subject everybody to standard consumer purchase laws. You fail, data was stolen, that's a breach of contract. We know how to handle breach of contract. We know, we know how to handle product liability. Yeah. Do you think there's gonna be any, any breaches with, the, with Equifax and, and the fact that they've breached, lost all this data? And... Gosh, yeah, that, well, so I, I, the Equifax part, you know, that's, a, that's a whole other, that, I mean, but I argue, generally speaking, as a software developer. They should be liable. They should be liable. I, I personally believe that, that, that Equifax should be treated as a liability case. It was a failure of fiduciary responsibility. It is, it is, it is almost, I would argue, criminal. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we need to get away from, I mean, this is completely an aside to the zero dollar car, but I've had the pleasure because of zero dollar car speaking to insurance age groups and all. And I said, said that what's an insurance executive summit, I said, listen, you guys are pretty much at fault for why we have, now it didn't, my comment predates Equifax by a couple of months, but breaches generally. I went and said boldly, you folks are pretty much at fault for why this happens. And they're looking at me, I'm like, you offer a product called cybersecurity insurance. Why? And they're like, well, because of breaches. I said, okay, great, stop. Do you offer insurance for criminal CEO behavior? And they're like, absolutely not. What do we, why? Well, it's felonious and we just get rid of them and we're, okay, great. Breaches that are happening are happening because of failure for companies to understand the tools and the technology that they're using and they are blindly deploying and they're not following fiduciary responsibility. You cannot use software and not understand its fiduciary responsibility. So, ergo, stop putting out insurance, cover it under stupidity, and guess what? People, if they don't have insurance, will either stop doing what they're doing or they will actually do it the right way. 
but you're offering them a protection. Oh, I, I get out of jail free. Mm -hmm. I go in front of Congress, I talk a little bit about it, I blame the one poor IT guy way down in some organization, yeah. and then I, I walk away. And everybody gets their bonuses. And everyone gets their bonuses, and 125 or 140 million in the case of Equifax, people, 140 million people are now at significant risk because the data is what they call first order richness. I mean, it's social security numbers, emails, confirmed stuff. phone numbers, right? I mean, it's, it's confirmed rich data. Let's stay with the with the uh, insurance company. Yeah. Progressive is you know selling uh, ODB ports that you can put in your car that they will collect information about whether or not you're a safe driver or not. You give that to them, they can use it to set rates and set policies, and they give you a discount for it. Is that the beginning of this path of? of discounting of vehicles? I mean, it's the first, it's, it's a discounting the service, right? I mean, so you, in theory, all of them have agreed we'll never use it to give you a bad rate, which, I mean, that's, that's a, okay. I can remember back in the day, uh, video stores, uh, we will never use your social, sorry, right. in the social security number, we will never actually use it. And all of a sudden, now it's in the video store, now it's the index number, right? I mean, yeah. it's all well and good to have a human it, policy. It's also in terms of liability and accidents, when if there is an accident, exactly. that data can be used in court. And it should be, right? I mean, I, I would argue that it should be, right? So. Um, is it, you know, is it the first, it is, we're on the path there. Uh, I know in our, in our pre, sort of pre-questions, one of the questions you said, is there anyone doing it? The first, there's a couple companies who are, like, uh, there's a company called um, uh, Maze, M-A-I-Z-E, and they're offering um, marketing and advertising around the car. So you go get the car and you can drive wherever you want. I mean, there's advertising, so basically you're, you're a driving billboard. Mm -hmm. Um, their uh, Telenab just announced as part of the CES launch that they're going to now offer um, basically an advertising subsidy model to OEMs for OEMs to offer to consumers to basically cover the cost of data. So if you're willing to get targeted adverts to your head unit, mm -hmm. then the data cost, right, the, you know, the connection cost actually gets underwritten. Um, and if you say no, that's fine, then you get charged the full price. So we're beginning to see these applications, right? Um, no one has yet gone as far as we're talking about in terms of the car. However, there is a company, a uh, startup out of Israel, Autonomo, O-T-O-N-O-M-O dot A-I. Um, and they're probably going to be the closest. They're trying to be a data broker uh, for the OEMs, for the OEMs to figure out where this is going to go and what's going to happen, right? As we argue in the book, the OEMs are stuck. None of them are big enough. I mean, they could all do it on their own, but none of them are big enough to make enough dent in the amount of data that we're talking about to actually be you know, worthwhile for someone like WPP or Publicis or someone to throw huge dollars at this. That is the Google's, I mean, that is the terabytes of data, right, that Google and others have. So the OEMs have a very interesting question ahead of them. What do they do? Do they, do they try and play into this? Do they sell into it? Do they work with their consumers? I mean. What do they do? Whose data really is it? Because if you bought the car, technically you bought the car, right? That's still an unanswered question. Since you bought the car. We're talking about this for years. Yes, exactly. Like all the sensors are there. The automaker has the information. They can tune the car. They can tell you when to get it fixed. They, can, they, they have all this information. The consumer doesn't have any transparency into it, really. No. Um, and, 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 and that gap has never been closed. No. Well, there's the gap technically, and there's also the gap now, because the technical gap existed, we've never actually closed the legal gap, which is who actually, like, when you do a SAL, you know, uniform commercial code, do you actually own this, right? OEMs are beginning to pull the software stuff that we do. You do not get to, you get to buy the software, you don't buy software, you license, license the software from yeah. now on. And that was GM's comment in 2015 with DMCA, right, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. You know, you buy the steel and you license the software, which, you know, it got a lot of, lot of blowback from the industry because it was the first time anyone had literally come out and now treated the vehicle more like a phone or a computer when they had so, for so many years, tried to distance themselves from the consumer electronics space. And now they're like, no, we're going to play the same card. All the software's licensed. Uh, you don't own it, we own it, and then sort of by extension, is the data owned by them? Since they own the software that generates the data, do they own the data? I, so many open questions. And that's again part of, the, part of what the book calls out is, the time is now. Like, we've unfortunately let this Pandora box open, and, and our regulators don't understand, our, 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 our legislator doesn't understand, heck, our consumers don't even understand. If, any, if anything, about. we're going in the opposite direction, where ISPs can now use all of your personal data, see yes. where you're going, and we've seen it in traffic on PC Mag. The amount of interest in VPNs in the last 12 months, oh. because of the changes in the regulatory environment, I'm they sure. have shot through the roof. Yep. And now it seems not so much that we're getting paid for giving away our private data. It seems more like that individuals have to pay more in order to protect their data yes. in the form of a VPN uh, that'll let you browse on your phone and on your desktop without your ISP having transparency to what you're doing. 
Well, and two, th and two things come to mind with that, right? First off is net neutrality, the repeal. Uh, you know, so ISPs know when you're behind a VPN. They, don't, they can't tell what's on it, but they can tell you're on a VPN. Yeah. So suddenly, terms and conditions, will they, oh, so I don't know what you're doing. You, under copyright law, I'm concerned that you might be streaming, right? So I'm gonna suddenly downgrade you, dethrottle you. Uh, what was it, just the big, on Slashdot, and a competitor to you, but the most recent you know, conver story came out, right? There's an ISP in the East Coast that sent threatening letters to their customers saying, oh, and by the way, if we suspect that you're streaming copyrighted materials, like we're gonna shut down your service, which means like your Nest service, your thermostats, the stuff that Northeast U.S. bitter cold, and an ISP is saying, "Yo, hey, your internet connection's at risk." Right? We have we are in such un, unclear space about what is actual ownership and not. Um, and then, you know, with with VPN, actually, also the other the other part of it is, okay, people want privacy, but here's the problem: whenever I ask people the question, "Is privacy a right?" Mm -hmm. Do you have a right to privacy? A lot of people say, yes, I do. I'm like, okay, great. Can you point to me The legal here? document that establishes exactly. that right. And they kind of scratch their head. I'm like, there are, a word right implies an obligation on somebody's part. It's a very legal and technical term. So if you think you have the right to privacy, point to me where you think you have that right from. And it turns out they want privacy, but they don't, they don't, now they don't understand the whole right conversation. I said, this is so important to understand because we've never enshrined the right to privacy in any document anywhere. So when people say to me, well, wait a minute, do you, should you be able to buy your privacy? Or what? I go, why not? If privacy was a privilege, because it's not a right, why not buy privilege? We buy privilege all the time. We buy privilege for how we get to places. And then of course now a lot of questions come up on equity. You know, if you can't afford privacy, like how does that work? So there are so many unanswered questions. We don't propose in the book that we have all of them. We're just like, it's time to have the conversation in a real meaningful way, not in a 140 or now 280 character tweet or a six second vine. It's gotta be something bigger and more deep. It seems to me that the role of uh, not just, when we look at the government on a federal level, on a state level, there's not a lot of encouragement, not a lot of things to see there, but when I look at it on a municipal level, on a city level, I see leaders that are willing to negotiate, to make changes, to take advantage of these technological revolutions. And particularly when it comes to automotive, um, you know, to roll out, Las Vegas has done an amazing job of encouraging the development of autonomous vehicles here in the city. And they had to do that by creating a legal framework that allowed this testing to be done. I, I took my first uh, uh, automated vehicle ride this, this morning. Oh, did you? And, um, What'd you take? It was a, it was a BMW 5 Series, okay. uh, Aptiv and Lyft. Okay. We're putting it together. And we went from this end of the strip all the way to Caesars Palace and back. Anyone in the driver's seat or no uh, driver? There was a safety driver okay. in there. Um, and he had to operate it on private property. Yep. But ironically, on public roads, the car was in autonomous mode. Yeah, I mean, so um, kudos to you know, folks like Tina Quigley, RTC, that's the group that, that manages the traffic here. Uh, NIAS, which is the autonomous systems group, uh, they're, they're more for drones. But Nevada, you know, Governor Sandoval has done an amazing job in trying to bring together policy and legislators to understand that, you know, this isn't really a technological, I mean, yes, there is tech, there's always going to be tech. I'm not suggesting that that's, you know, all solved, but there's going to become a point in time when autonomy is just like the outlet on the wall. It's just there. So now let's figure out the operational, the societal impacts. Like, how do we do this? For example, how does a vehicle, you know, how does a vehicle know that or uh, or seed way to a fire truck? I mean, right now we don't have connected vehicles. They're not connected. We do it by sound. Everything we do is by a human being. Every rule, every thought, every structure, every everything is human centric. So what happens when we pull the human completely out of that driver's seat? And we're not doing enough to think about that. And you're right, so you know, city of Las Vegas, the, the state of Nevada, city of LA, uh, Eric Garcetti and, and, and Salida Reynolds, the GM for LADOT. I mean, there are some amazing, you're right, the municipalities, um, NACTA, which is National, uh, National Association of City Transportation Officials, municipalities is where, where stuff gets done, right? The cities, the states can you know, pontificate. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the states and the feds can pontificate, but the cities are, are where it actually gets done. It also seems like they, they're in the best position to negotiate with, with uh, ride-sharing businesses. Like, you know, Uber and Lyft make a fair amount of money providing services inside city limits. They should be opening up, in order to, to, to get access to the streets, they should be opening up their data sets to the city so that you can manage traffic, you can, you can do more urban planning. You know, and, and I don't know that that exchange always takes place. Uh, it doesn't right now, um, and, and for a lot of you know a lot of you know really interesting reasons, right? I mean, in terms of Uber and Lyft, they're private companies. You know, haven't gone public yet. They're trying to figure out their valuations and data is you know at the heart. I mean, everyone's in an uncertain world, and you know, if you don't want to open it unless you know what you're going to do for fear that you can't close it after the fact, right? So, so I can appreciate the the conundrum. 
Um, but one of the interesting questions that we've been posing to people as, as, as my partners and I go around the world is, is, you know, today we have what we believe is the right to drive anywhere. It's not really a right, it's a privilege, granted through DMVs, right? The states grant, you know, they grant reciprocal rights, so if you show up, you, know, you show up from New York to here, you can drive under reciprocity to the fact that you're from the state of New York and you show up with a New York license, right? Um, but that's all because we're considered citizens and we have this shared belief of taxes and the taxation thereof. Great. What happens when the car doesn't have a human being driving it? Is it actually more of a utility? In which case, the real question is, what about rights of way? Like, who owns the rights of way? And, and so one of the questions that we've been talking to cities about is, you know, as you look at this, you know, don't presuppose that an autonomous car should just automatically have the right to ride on your roads. Um, and again, a lot of that singleton ownership and, and personal ownership, and so, so much is you know, in, in, in question, and that's why I keep saying to people, don't worry about the tech. Stop worrying about pilots. The and, tech is going to happen. Don't worry about proofs of concept. Like, but start thinking deeply. Eventually, it's going to work. Exactly. And, and, but think deeply about what it means to redesign your city. Because if you have the opportunity today to say, you know what? This road is now, uh, um, sorry, for that type of car, this is now a right of way. And under the original rules that we have for right of ways that we grant for telecoms and others, we have a pricing mechanism and a, you know, it's just, it's not, you just get passage because you had passage when the human was driving. It's a completely different construct, right? There's so many different ways to think about this. And it's fascinating, interesting, some pretty cool times. And I'm sure my kids at some future point will be like, you did what, when? Or my grandkids will be like, what was that, grandpa? Yeah. yeah. When do you think? Uh, so, I mean, I was talking to. I always talk to the Las Vegas cab drivers as I'm coming back and forth just to get a tone for the show. The cab drivers. Yeah, the, the cab drivers. Okay. And um, they and talk. I, they, I've never heard. Anyone, I've never heard anyone talk to me. You know, it's not always a good thing when they do. <laughs> but the. Uh, and I told one of them. I was like, "No, we're, I'm getting this demo today, and it's a self-driving car." And he went quiet for a minute, and he was like, "So when are those cars going to be on the road?" And he wasn't asking casually. No, I know. And um, and I was like, "Well, it's it's going to happen pretty soon, like a lot sooner than I thought." And um, he was quiet again, and he said, "You know, there's just there's no place in today's economy for somebody that isn't educated." And I was like, "I think you might be true. That might be so." Yeah. But like, that's another situation where these actions, are, these technologies are going to have consequences. Yes. Technology is going to work. Like, there's no way you can keep self-driving cars off the road. Uh, but we need to have a response that's a little bit more thought out than what we've got right now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, whether whether it's a taxi job, whether it's trucks, and then it's truck drivers, right? Whether I mean, it's you know when the when uh, in fact again, state of Nevada, the uh, what they call it, the truck of independence, whatever. It was the um, auto did the the shared joint group with Budweiser, and they delivered you know, it was 127 or 125 miles of autonomous drive with an 18 wheeler, and. Um, Immediately thereafter, uh, you know, sort of one of the pundits wrote a story about sort of the impact of trucking on U.S. economy. And it's measured in millions, millions of people between drivers and people who load. But more importantly, he went after what they call the second, third, and fourth you know, sort of order mm -hmm. of people. So, for example, the, the, the truck stops, so the gas stations, the convenience stores, the dispensaries. Obviously, when we go from gas to electric, you know, the gas station kind of goes away. Then you go into the Motel 6s and others, or the people who are cleaning, you know, hotels. You go to the diners, people who are served, right? You start knocking down all those people, especially geographically, where the only way they're living is because truck traffic or driving human traffic is passing through. Um, it's profound in terms of the landscape of the U.S., right? Um, I'm not going to be so egalitarian, or sorry, so, so maybe uh, elitist to say you, there's no place for an uneducated person in the economy. I would argue that you, everyone has to be educated to some degree. I mean, in some cases, it's a requirement in order to be in a, in a quote-unquote democracy. You have to be educated to be able to vote. Um, so, but yes, it, it is going to be scary. And unfortunately I, unfortunately, I don't think we have the political structures to have these kinds of conversations right now. Like I said, the tweets and the vines, they're not enough. They're not enough. So zero dollar, zero dollar car is out now. Yep. Are you going to follow it up with more zero dollar industries just to look at how this effect can go from industry to industry? So in the book, we actually do cover a couple other, and we talk about um, the zero dollar home. So we talk about the idea of what could happen you know, in your home. And, and of course, I already, I, I've done it. It's all, I'm already the editor, and all of a sudden the, the Roomba 
you know, scandal, you know, mm-hmm. po- or not scandal, the Roomba articles, you know, pops up. I'm like, oh, holy cow. And then uh, I had talked pre- you know, about a year ago, uh, in, as well as about the zero dollar home, like Procter and Gamble and the things you could do. So now all of a sudden you could get your Samsung, you know, you can get a refrigerator. So you get your durable goods, right? So the durable goods into the house. Would you ever get a zero dollar home? Eh, probably not. I mean, a three, and again, you brought up a good point. The base cost part of a home. Mm-hmm. But could you substantially reduce it? Could you do things where you're more like... Um, I mean, you could certainly see Amazon eventually paying you to have an Alexa-enabled home. Absolutely. Because by doing that, they are making themselves your Absolutely. retailer of choice. Well, it's funny you should say that. So uh, I do uh, some technology you know, evangelism and guidance work with um, Leading Builders of America. It's, a, it's, a, it's an association of the top 20 or 30 builders in, in the U.S., home builders, and then what they call light commercial, so like one-story or two-story condos. Um, and in the last two years that I've been you know, working with them, there's been a, a tone and tenor shift. So two years ago, they were all, one, one, one gentleman spoke very, uh, Apple called me, Google called me, and Amazon called me. And he was speaking publicly about this. So then this last one, this past June, there's like five or six of them are now, oh my gosh, yeah, 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 we're getting calls from Mountain View and Cupertino, and they're, it's just like the automotive industry. They're getting on planes and they're flying out, and they're like, these guys love us, yeah. amazing. And, I'm like, and so I stood up in, the, in front of all of them, I said, listen, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you not to do it, but I am gonna tell you, make sure you understand why they're doing it. Do not presuppose that you understand why they're doing it, because just like every other industry that I've worked with, they're not doing it because of the betterment of that industry. They're doing it in an asymmetric thought pattern, which is the betterment of their industry. Again, nothing wrong with that, but do not make the mistake of thinking you know what they want, because they will absolutely out-negotiate you in terms of everything else, and then all of a sudden you're gonna get stuck. So for example, to one builder I said, are you prepared to be a ship and remember builder? He's like, what do you mean? I go, well, Today, you're ship and forget. You build a house, you sell it to Dan, and then you walk away. And then we have the aftermarket, DIY and aftermarket, to come in and mod the house. And he's like, yeah. I go, but when you sell the house and you decide, you, the builder, decide to put Alexa in and you imbue it and everything, right? The walls, the fiber and everything, that's a product choice you've made. You now have an obligation to continue to maintain it. That's ship and remember. And you're never, based on current contract law, going to get out of that obligation. You built the home with that obligation into it, and you can't pass it. So you're gonna start doing software updates to the house. And he looked at me, he's like, uh, I, I don't, I go, and you get Bluetooth locks. When we go down this path of bringing software into what was previously an inert physical object, example, the car companies are doing it, phone company, you are what I call a software company. Regardless of whether you think you're a software, you're now a software company, and whatever you, what you used to do is what gets wrapped around it, right? So you're no longer a home builder, you're a software company who delivers homes, right? There's a very distinct difference in mental mindset and fiduciary responsibility. And what we're seeing, what we're understanding is these companies just don't understand it, right? And so what I've gone out as part of the book and education is I go to these owners and say, let me tell you be very clearly, Google will figure out how to build a home. And the minute they figure out how to build a home, they're already a software company, they'll now be a software company that delivers a home, right? My statement, they'll fulfill that, or Amazon, or, and that is the problem that we run into. And so we have to figure out, quite honestly, again, with insurance companies, how do we get this right? Because we can, we can do this the right way, but we can also do it the wrong way. And the wrong way is to celebrate people, like the CEOs of companies who have these massive breaches, and we don't fix the fundamental problem. We try and band-aid it with something like a cybersecurity insurance policy. Is there, is there anything that you would recommend to individual consumers in terms of knowing their worth, knowing the value of their data, and making better choices in terms of what products they use in order to help leverage what, they, what so many vendors are just taking freely? Well, so I, the only guidance I had, and, and I talked about it a little bit in the TED talk, or the TEDx talk, excuse me, um, is if you see something for what looks like zero dollars, ask for the full price and see if they will give you a full price. Because by doing that, that will tell you what your, what your data is worth. Mm-hmm. Now the problem is if you go to Google and say, I want to pay for email, you don't know what your data, you know, Google won't do that for you. So you have to go find a for pay email service. And you can find them, but they're, they're far and few between. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, but you can figure out, okay, what does that piece of my data look like? Can you buy a browser? Mm, no but can you buy upgrades to browsers that give you secure browsing? Yes, okay, what does that mean? So that secure means that, so you can piecemeal, right? And I think, again, as part of what we're trying to talk about in the book is, you cannot be passive anymore. If you really believe that you have a right to privacy, then you have to defend that right. Now, I, I know and you know it's not a right, but you, if you literally are gonna use the word right, then you have to defend it, which means you have to fight for it. 
which means you have to actually argue for it, which means you have to understand what it means, and ergo, we're into that point. Again, I'm not anti-Google. I'm not anti-Amazon. I am anti the asymmetric conversation to date. Amen to that. Yeah. John, always an interesting conversation. Thanks Buddy, so much yeah, for talking no, to me. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Enjoy your CES. How many years of CES is this for you? 15 this year. I think I'm about that, too. I know. It's starting I'm to get a little bit old. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But have a great show. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's Fast Forward for today. I want to thank you for stopping by. We'll, as always, you can find past episodes of this show on PCMag.com. I'll see you in the future.